I gotta fix my sound really quickly. You guys ready? Yo. Hey, Hello. how you doing, dude? Hey, how you doing? Not bad, not bad. For those of my guests that don't know you, who are you and what are you doing here? Uh, my name is ZLZ or Sam Curry, and I've been doing bug bounty for about like three years. Uh, I think today we're going to talk about like some of the bugs and just like uh, general bug hunting. Yeah. The, I don't know if you've watched any of the streams. The format is usually the same. It's about who you are, how did you get started, what advice okay. you have for other hackers. Whatever you can talk about, you can talk about with, with bugs and stuff. Um, but I just want you to have fun with it. And I want people to know, you know, who you are and how did you become ZLZ, the guy that, you know, casually hacked Tesla with a broken window. <laughs> I got you. Um, so how did you... For people that don't know, if you don't know Sam, go on HackerOne.com. I'm pulling up your profile right now. This is ZLZ. Um, you can go on his website. He has some really, really good write-ups. You've been on fire lately. You've been putting some really cool stuff out, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Which, which we'll get to in a little bit. He has some really cool write-ups. Um, check him out. His Twitter is right here, too. Give him a follow. But before we get started about the hacking stuff, man, like, how did you, like, without bug bounties, like, forget about bug bounties, how did you hear about hacking? What'd you, like, how'd you get into it? When I was, like, in high school, maybe even, like, a little bit before that, like, I was always just kind of interested in, uh, like, video games and computers, and uh, I spent, like, a lot of time doing, like, glitching on video games, and, like, I loved, like, the whole, like, thought process behind it, uh, but I eventually got in, like, some community for hacking RuneScape, which is, like, a multiplayer game, and everybody in the RuneScape community was, like, really dedicated to, like, uh, bug abusing, like, in the game, but then this guy came along, and he was, like, let's actually try to hack, like, these websites. So, like, I don't know. Like, I was really young. I was, like, maybe 13 or 14. And it was just, like, this whole, like, cloak and dagger. Like, everybody's trying to hack each other's website because everybody has all these, like, community websites and forums and MyBB. And uh, it, it probably wasn't, like, super ethical. But, like, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed, like, the processes and everything that was going on. Uh, but I think after, like, at that point, like, I was just really interested in, like, web application security. And I had done, like, a lot of... Uh, I tried to work with people in the past with like reporting security vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was ever a time like I exploited something maliciously where it's like I had some like I don't know a monetary goal or something like that. Right. But it was always just kind of more the thought process behind it. But how did you hear about bug bounties? Oh yeah, uh, bug bounty. Uh, I think somebody in uh, one of the forums was like we were chatting about stuff, and he had mentioned uh, he dropped a link to a hacker one program and he like wanted to do like a contest on who could find uh cross set scripting or like some sort of bug first. I think it was whoever could find the first bug and it was kind of like a friendly competition. Okay. And I was like, Oh, this is really cool. So I saw the website and I was like super, super interested because in high school, like uh, I was sort of doing the similar approach for websites that didn't necessarily have a bug money program. So like I would report like, let's say security vulnerabilities to my high school or like uh like a local university here, I just spend time, you know, just messing with their stuff and sending an email if I found something. So when I saw a bug bounty, I was like, holy, like people are getting, like the whole meme about like, oh, people are getting paid for this. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was something I sort of been interested in, but uh, I think a week passed and like he, one of the person who posted that challenge gave up, but I was like still looking into it and trying to find the vulnerability. And then I finally did. And uh, I think they paid out like $500. And at the time I was working at like a fast food restaurant and it was like my whole paycheck so i was like okay this is like wow, actually, that is crazy that is pretty yeah. crazy if you think about it like you found one bug and it paid for your whole paycheck yeah pretty much did you do less hours than you would when you were working at the fast food chain no it was it was really unhealthy i think i did uh the same amount i was doing like high school work and then like i'd come home and like stay up till two or three in the morning for like weeks and weeks and weeks uh i was just really obsessive at the very beginning and like I really enjoyed it, but eventually, like, I quit the job because I was making more uh, doing bug bounty, and then, like, eventually got to the point, yeah. But, um, like, my thing is, when you started doing bug bounties, or just hacking, how did you, like, how did you learn it? How did you learn, you know, like, these different bug types? I think, like, a lot of time, when I started, like, I really didn't know, uh, I think, actually, there's there's kind of this misconception that, like, 
when you are approaching bug bounty, you kind of have to like figure everything out and then like jump into it. But like when I started, I, I didn't know anything. I think I knew like cross-site scripting, SQL injection. And you know, the reasons I knew those were just like, cause we would, we would all mess around on like forms and like, you know, attack everybody else's websites, uh, more in like a kind of friendly way. It was like it was a hobby. Sound, you were doing it. You were, yeah, exactly. yeah, it was a hobby thing. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I yeah, know yeah. What you mean. So you but, guys uh, would each have different websites, and then you attack each other's websites, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Sort of like Yobert had explained when he was working with Mikhail like early, and they would like build yeah, websites yeah. and hack each other. Uh, but it was like kind of a similar environment. And uh, I think when I started, like the only thing I really knew about was like you know those like really simple bug classes. But like by spending time like only hunting for those bug classes, and like spending time like reading Hacktivity and like. Twitter uh, write-ups. I eventually like learned about other stuff, and uh, eventually just kind of like new majority of bug classes and went from there. Um, are you going to school right now? I like sort of off and on. Uh, I, I'm about like a year and a half into university, and I kind of like took a step back because I really enjoy bug hunting. And uh, like right now, I feel like I'm in like a good situation to be able to like do that and like explore different programs and like spend my time like kind of figuring that stuff out but like maybe down the road like if i have like a uh, you know kids or like a house or like a lot of obligations it would make it a little bit more tough so i really want to spend the time like right now doing bug hunting uh so sort of <laughs> a are, little are bit you doing, are you doing it full time like with bug hunting you yeah i've been doing full time yeah 100 uh with all like these life hacking events recently uh and like all these programs that have been popping up i've been spending like majority of my time doing bug, bug hunting uh i'm not doing anything else so i definitely say like full-time bug bounty hunter okay uh but I, yeah i try to work like a, a schedule right now for like bug hunting so walk me through it what does it look like being a full-time bug bounty hunter dude like do yeah. you do you have set days you hack do you just do whenever you feel like it do you, like how does that work as a you know like i want to know how you handle everything being a full-time bug bounty hunter yeah, so like I find it really difficult to work. Uh, like when I try to like set work schedules, it's really difficult uh, because like a lot of times I'll sit down and if I like, for instance, like am like task oriented to like find bugs in a particular program, uh, it'll be very difficult to do that. But like what I like to do is kind of like set up my days where I have like a time period to do like uh, something security related, right. but not necessarily bug bounty hunting. Uh, so for instance, like. Uh, I don't know, like let's say today I woke up around like 9.30 in the morning and I have this period uh, between like 10.30 and 3 p.m. where I just kind of like sit down on my computer. Uh, and since I enjoy the process, it really helps a lot because like, uh, you know, like let's say I don't have any objective, I'll kind of naturally be drawn to like trying to find bugs. Uh, okay. But I don't know, if, if I don't really feel like hacking too much, typically I'll just spend time like reading about stuff or uh, like watching videos, uh, just anything security related or like, you know, taking breaks and playing games. But I feel like eventually, since I really enjoy it, like I'll always eventually like fall into that process where I'm trying to find the bug. Uh, I guess you, recently you I, don't have a, you don't have a, um, like a formal way of doing it. It's just whenever no. it comes to you, you go and do it. Yeah. It's, it's really strange. Cause it's like kind of like a formal informality because like I do have like time periods where it's like, I want to do something on my computer that's like somewhat productive here. Uh, I'm not going to like, you know, for instance, be like super particular, be like, I want to hack on this program and try to find X, Y, Z. Uh, but it's more just like I set up my day so that I have that time available and I know that I'm drawn to that. There are some days, for instance, where like I'll feel like crap and but I'll still try to sit down and like uh, read through stuff and do something somewhat productive. So you since you do this full time, do you feel a lot of pressure when you, when you, you know, when, because you got to pay your bills, right? Like, yeah, you're young. I know that, you know, you probably like the amount of bills that you have to pay for isn't as, you know, having your own whatever, right? Your, your bills are a little yeah. bit less, but still it's got to be a lot of pressure to have to pay for those. It's um, definitely like a lot of, it's definitely a lot of pressure, but I feel like uh, one of the things like I've kind of suggested to people before and like kind of realized like helps a lot is like, uh, if you're trying to like immediately go like full-time bug bounty hunting, it's going to be really, really difficult because their bugs are so sporadic, you know, you may find like one in a month and the next month you find like 30. Uh, but what I realized that like helped with the pressure uh, is just like having like a cushion, uh, you know, like pay your rent a couple months in advance if you can. Right. 
And at that point, like you can dedicate more time to it. So I don't feel like a tremendous amount of pressure financially. Uh, it does kind of come up every once in a while. Like if I'm like two months down the line and I haven't found the bug and it's like, or like lacking motivation or, you know, like start to question whether or not like I enjoy this stuff anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah, Just yeah. kind of those doubts that pop up. So being young, um, what did your family think of <laughs> hacking and making money from hacking, dude? It had to be an uh, interesting conversation, right? Yeah, I was a really, I was a really terrible kid. Uh, so like my, it was kind of like, like I was very like you know mischievous and like was very like anti-authority or whatever. So like my my parents were both like very like uh, when I presented to them this this idea that like I was making money online like doing uh, bug bounty hunting. I think I had received before I found Hacker One, like a company had like uh, PayPal'd me, and then I couldn't cash out the PayPal, so they sent a check. And uh, my my parents were like, what is this? You know, like this is this is so crazy. Like you yeah, have where to be this come from. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But uh, it, it took a little bit, but I think they eventually realized like uh, all the time I was spending like online and like on my computer was like productive. Uh, it came at a cost though, because I was like, a terrible student uh, in like school and growing up, and like uh, it was it was kind of like for them it was a lot. It was really difficult to like you know they have their idea of like what will be a good thing for me to be doing, and then what I enjoy doing and what i think would be good but it took a while but now they, they're okay with it yeah i was gonna say how's it going now <laughs> now that uh it, you know it's playing out a yeah it's going, yeah it, it's going great i mean uh it's it's definitely a lot better <laughs> than when it originally started so uh, i think i was 16 when 16 i first, when got it first it. started uh yeah so now that you know you said you when you first started you knew xss you knew sql injection and a couple other you know phone types how did you know, how did you learn the rest of them how did you you know how did you hear about those other bugs what did you do to learn them did you set up goals like how did that work i think uh i didn't necessarily set up goals but i think more when i like one of my when i started hunting like my original process is just like sit down and try to find like a bug class like let's say you know like i start bug hunting when i'm like 16 or whatever and i'm sitting down trying to find like cross-site scripting uh going through that whole process where like you're looking for that like one particular bug you run into a bunch of stuff like for instance okay. uh in your stream you mentioned like rss feeds so it's like quickly googling like you know what is an rss feed like how can i interact with this and then like you kind of take that and you like research security stuff related to it uh you know there there was like a ton of resources available uh, at the time and i think like alongside hacking i was like always interested in like the other stuff and like what i was seeing you know for instance uh you know, you learn about a tool like your search, uh, by like keeping tabs on Twitter and you see like somebody tweet about it. You're like, okay, what is this? And you run their search and then you see like a application.waddle and you're like, what is application.waddle? So then you Google it, you figure it out and then you find like bug classes related to it. You know, for instance, like uh, XXE. Uh, but I feel like it's just a whole process of like just slowly running through information I think the biggest thing is like not being afraid of admitting that you don't know what something means. Yeah. And like having the balls to Google. I think people think like, you know, Googling it is, I don't understand like why people think Googling it is not the answer. That's the first thing I always do. <laughs> Even yeah. like with some life stuff, I've caught myself like I go and Google the answer for them. Like no one's going to answer this thing about life, but let's just try it out anyways. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. It, it's so strange that there's like this perception of like, uh, the whole like Stack Overflow developer, where it's like uh, somebody will tweet like, "How many of you guys Google like Stack Overflow when you're at work?" And it's like everybody's like, "Yeah, of course I do." You know, there's no other way I'd figure this stuff out. But yeah, I think I think like having getting rid of like the ego associated with hacking and like being able to move forward on like I don't know this, it's completely foreign to me. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. Is like completely beneficial. Um, how many hours are you spending right now with bug bounties? Are you spending 20, 40, 60 hours or? Right now, like, uh, there's like a live hacking event coming up. So I've been spending like a lot, a lot of time, like probably 50 or 60 hours uh, yeah. a week. Yeah, at least in, in the last week. Typically, it's probably between like 20 and 30 hours. Uh, but I've been really invested for this event. So I've been putting in a bit more time. Are you hacking alone? I have a, I'm, I have two, I'm hacking with Dan Ritter and Jack Cable. Uh, oh, very cool. Dan Ritter, yeah. He's just someone uh, from my university who I know. And then Jack is Jack. 
So, so walk me through it. Um, for live hacking events, they give you guys a target. Sometimes you've known the target. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you know the target, but not the application in scope. How does that work? What do you do? Um, I know you, one of the biggest things that I've caught about you is you said, and I, I quote, it's very boring to do screenshots and click through them. <laughs> I'd rather look for XSS and that's my recon, right? How does that yeah. work? Explain for people that don't understand how that works. Well, I think like one of the, I think people, there are some people who are really great at like big picture and then like narrowing on something that they find. Like for instance, like uh, when you're doing your stream just now, like the whole process of like sublister and, you know, Wayback Machine and finding these particular URLs that are like interesting to you. I'm completely terrible at that. And I like more, my approach is more like, uh, you know, for instance, here's uh, www.ahoo.com. You can log in. Uh, there's like registration, login. Uh, you log in and there's a mail client and then like you have all that core functionality and then you spend time like interacting with that. And when I say like uh, trying to find cross site scripting in that, uh, I think in the context of like uh, you spend time like really digging into the core of the application and then like while you're hunting like along the way, testing these inputs, seeing how they behave uh, and cross site scripting as an example, like for instance, uh, you know, you're throwing in like a quote, double quote, uh, you know, like seeing if there's like, Angular JS, trying to get some alert to fire like that, and like it's it's just a great way to figure out like I think what's going on in the ap application. So I think one of the biggest questions that people are going to ask me is how do you the biggest thing is how do I find XSS? How do you look for XSS, dude? Because I know you you, yeah. you said that's that's your way of doing recon. You know, you go in there, you you look for parameters, you look for different things. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is like how do you you know that feeling when you get you go this is vulnerable. Yeah. You know, how how does that feeling work? Like, how does that work with, with you, at least? I think it's a lot of, like, uh, there's a lot of past experience with, like, certain interactions. Like, for instance, uh, I feel like if you've been hacking for a little bit, if you see, like, an application JSON that responds with, like, text HTML, you're going to be like, wait a second, like, this is probably set up wrong. Uh, for instance, like, uh, you know, if the content type is supposed to be application JSON, then, like, typically it's not going to URL encode strings that you're passing to it. So like seeing things like that are like big red flags for me. Uh, but I think the process is more identifying like what interactions you have, how the server responds to those, and then uh, just like uh, you know toying with it until you can find something or finding these points where you can. Right. Uh, but like I don't know the whole approach for like finding XSS, I guess, uh, would be more to the idea of uh, you know. It's it's hard to it's hard to explain because it's so much. It's like, a it's a pattern yeah. in behavior recognition. You yeah, have done absolutely. it so many times that you, you you recognize a pattern and you recognize a behavior, and based on the past experiences, you try different things for it to work. Yeah, exactly. But I still want to understand, like, for somebody who's finding really cool bugs, you must be doing you you do something to find these, right? It doesn't you know recon doesn't have to be just you know supplement enumeration and screenshots and that sort of stuff. Outside of that, like, what does what does recon mean to you, dude? Like, when you're hacking on a target, what does recon? What do you do, like, as a part of your recon? So for like for recon, I think like uh, I feel like I'm really good at like identifying like the actual uh, how everything's kind of working together uh, and how uh, like the actual behaviors of the the application. Now, for instance, okay. like when you were streaming just now, like you'd pulled up. Uh, canvas yql you know uh on yahoo and like when i saw that i immediately knew like okay i've seen this application in the past uh i know that typically you know from like past experience yql consoles like internally run on port 4080 and i know that in the past because i've seen like stack traces where like it'll show you the port and then therefore like i put all these pieces together and so like when i'm seeing you test for like test on canvas uh a bunch of these things popped in my head like Okay, one thing we could try to do is find some way to access like uh, the internal service that's running on 4080. So like one of the things I would have done, you know, is like changing the host header to append like port 4080 with just like past experience, and then like uh, testing like uh, just like the actual YQL stuff. You mentioned like the start of your stream uh, that like YQL is like a something that you should probably is important for like hacking on Yahoo, and uh, I totally agree with that. And like, if I were to approach like YQL, and I, I have in the past, is like reading through these 
uh, YQL guides. Like if right. you Google, for instance, uh, you know, YQL developer tutorial, you'll find a bunch of documentation about it. And then I, I think that's more my recon. Uh, I, I really, I have, a, I have a lot of respect for hackers like uh, Cash Money, for instance, who is like, I, I think if you spoke to him, you'd see that he's like very set on messing with these like core functionalities, I guess. Right. But so I guess I, that's my whole. Yeah. So I yeah. assume you read a lot of documentation. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's your kind of doing recon. It's understanding what these core functionalities are. Where are they? What the you know what the routes are. What, what you know what to send it. What parameters, um, and you know you enumerate on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so you've mentioned Jack Cable, Cash Money. I assume you collaborate with them. Once yeah, in a while. Every, yeah. For sometimes for live events, and sometimes I'll shoot a message if I find something that's like interesting, uh, and then just try to work something out. And, Figure it out why together. is uh why is collaboration important when it comes down to hacking or bug bounty hunting? I think it's just like there's a whole element of like uh someone has a different view than you. For instance, uh one of the one of the cool things about working with uh Dan Ritter is is my partner for this like a uh, bug hunting event and he actually hasn't like spent too much time on Yahoo. But I've spent like, you know, like the last three years I've spent primarily on Yahoo. So I have this very like set view of what I think Yahoo is, you know, like what sort of interactions there are, how it behaves. And like, you know, I, I, my mindset is completely like, it's very dependent on all of like my past experience. But what Dan's going to do is he's going to start like looking at this, this target and he's going to say, okay, this is interesting to me because of my past experience. This is interesting to me because of my past experience. And there's like this sort of like difference in approach and like thinking through something, uh, and then I think when you work together, you get like that combined uh, experience and like that, these like fresh viewpoints. Uh, and I guess secondly too, is like, it's it's so much more engaging, like when you're hacking with someone else. Uh, you know, for instance, like I've worked with uh, Doggy G a lot in the past and uh, there's some things like I really like to do and that Tommy like hates to do. Uh, so like if, if for instance, I'm having a lot of fun, like finding these interesting interactions and Tommy has a lot of fun, like exploiting them. Like I'll pass them off to him, and I'll pass them off to him, right. and then eventually we'll find something interesting. Cool. Um, you said something about past experiences. Yeah. What is your experience like, man? Like you said, you've gone to school for a little bit. Um, but what is your experience like? What have you done besides bug bounty hunting? Are you do the development? Is it just I did hacking for fun and turned into a hobby? What is your background like besides security? Uh, I think more. I I really. When I was really young, I really enjoyed computers, so I got into, uh, and it wasn't initially security, but it was kind of initially more development stuff. So I worked as like, a, when I was in high school, I did like, you know, application web application development, and I like uh, would build websites for people, and then that eventually turned into just like, uh, I don't know, like trying to learn out all these different, like, I had spent a lot of time like initially with PHP, but I moved into like Node, and then like these different web application technologies, and like building uh for people okay. and then uh so that was kind of alongside hacking uh but for computer stuff like i always just really enjoyed uh technology so i spent like a lot a lot of time like online and working with other people and just exploring that i guess so do you have so you have a background in coding at least like you you know something you know some web, web development yeah I'm, I'm definitely not like the best programmer uh <laughs> but I, like I enjoy it a lot and I have a bit of experience. Like I can understand a bit, uh, which I think is kind of, kind of important, like depending on what aspect of hacking you're doing is kind of mm -hmm. understanding uh, what's going on. You have people like Mark Litchfield who are like, yeah, I've never coded before. And they have their like own approach to hacking and maybe that works for them. But depending on like what sort of skills you have, you can definitely, you know, feed that in. How much has that uh, experience of coding helped you with your bug bounty hunting? It's helped a lot. Uh, for instance, like understanding these, uh, you know, for instance, recently, actually, there's uh, there's a really simple bug. And, and when you think about it, it's like, oh, that makes sense. But in a developer standpoint, uh, there is this like a blacklist for a certain, uh, appending like a certain uh, number, right? Okay. And uh, it's like, you can't append this number. If you do, we're just gonna drop the whole request and we're gonna give you a 403. But like having the background in development, like uh, you're thinking like, okay, they're not allowing me to send this number in particular. How is it evaluating that? 
and what can I do to like circumvent that? Mm -hmm. And it, the solution was simply like uh, just adding a zero beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then when it, eva it like evaluated that string, it was like, okay, that doesn't match that number. Therefore, we're gonna let it, let it go through. So I mean, like it helps a lot, like in certain contexts. But do you, so? Do you think it's a is it a requirement? Is it a supplement? Is it a must have? Good to have? I think it's, I think it's good to have. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a requirement at all. Uh, especially like I, I see way too many people who are uh, their thought process behind like wanting to start bug bounty or like do bug bounty hunting is that they have to like meet all these requirements. You know, like what books do I read? Like what classes do I take? What programming language do I need to learn? It's like you don't really need to learn any of those, but I think the important thing is just to, you know, your end goal is to find like security vulnerabilities. And if you can do that, you know, through uh, messing with web applications without any programming experience, then I think, you know, it's, if you enjoy it, then that's completely fine. I mean, um, I don't, you don't need to know all of it, but you, if you understand the basics of something, you know, it, yeah. it would help. With XSS, if you don't understand HTML, you can still find XSS, but yeah, you're going to miss a lot of them. Yeah, 100%. I think that's, like, really important. Uh, you see, like, a lot of people, like, for instance, cross-site scripting. It's so accessible because it's very – there's so many examples where it's very simple. You know, you see – uh, parameter equals one, and then changing it to script alert one. If it fires, therefore, there you have XSS, and there you can report the bug. But like you're saying, you know, like, is it good to have a programming background? It's like, yeah, of course. Like, with that programming background, ugh, <laughs> with that programming background, uh, you could turn that into something like more, or potentially, uh, you know, with that programming background, you could identify that it's you know vulnerable to something else too. Like for instance, uh, XSS a lot of times is like there's SSTI there, and you wouldn't even know. So, um, let's talk about tools. What are some tools that you regularly use? I majority of the time I spend in like, uh, you know, Burp Suite, Sublister, Dirt Search, and Burp Suite. Like I'm heavily, heavily, heavily like manual and testing. Uh, I really, really, really like ninety nine percent of the time I'm just sitting there in a repeater like playing with stuff. Uh, and the other, like, you know, 10% of the time is just, like, doing, like, base level recon or, like, trying to investigate something particular. Okay. And uh, so I would say, like, for tools, like, Burp Suite is, like, a huge, huge one where, like, there's all these sub functionalities like Intruder. Uh, and I'll spend, like, a lot of time in Intruder uh, just, like, for instance, doing, like, automation stuff or uh, trying to exploit something that's particular. For instance, uh, like brute forcing basic auth or something like that. But I'm very, I don't really use too many tools. So those are the, your, your tool belt of some sort. Those are the only ones. Directory so research, burp. And... Yeah, it's very, I, yeah, very basic. Well, I mean, nothing's wrong with that. You, you found out <laughs> what works with you though, right? Like what works for you and yeah. you don't have to overcomplicate it. I mean, if it's not yeah, broke, you, know, you, know, if you don't have to fix it if it's not broke, right? Yeah. Uh, do you have any certificates? I don't. For a little bit, I was pursuing like an OSCP. Uh, I was working as like a security consultant for about like six months, and I was like pursuing that for the job specifically. Uh, but I was never too interested in like security certificates. I don't think they're a bad thing, but uh, I just don't have any. What do you think of uh, people getting into getting like something like OSCP for bug bounty hunting? Do you think that's? I don't think it's a requirement, but what are, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I definitely don't think it's a requirement, but I mean, like, uh, I think the the idea behind like getting the certificate is definitely a good one. Like a lot of people, I mean, like a lot of people at security meetups are like, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about web application security, so what I did is I went out and got my OSCP, and uh, then I learned about you know how to interact with these things and like got a little bit more experience. Uh, when it comes to certificates, you know, there's I, I see both sides of the conversation where it's. Uh, People could tell you like, hey, you know, like, why are you going to university if you could just Google it and you could figure it out? Yeah. Um, and it's like, oh, it's a waste of money. But like, on the other hand, it's like, there's some people where it's motivational to be able to have like, you know, someone who's giving you a test or something like that. And I think if if, if you can learn that way, then absolutely go for it. Yeah, I think um, I agree. I mean, if you're not someone who doesn't enjoy uh, learning stuff on their own and you need someone to like kind of push you to get better and learn stuff at works. But um, I don't know. I don't think it's the, 
it's the key to bug hunting. There's nothing but you to keep yeah. bug hunting, right? Um, not enough tools or certificates are going to help with that. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think like uh, the most underrated like the the most underrated like approach to like learning bug hunting is like actually spending time trying to bug hunt, which sounds kind of crazy at first, right? You kind of ask like, how do I bug hunt if I don't know how to bug hunt? But the whole like you know taking the first steps like downloading Burp, throwing up Firefox, trying to like hop on a program, and just kind of like slowly figuring it out and like asking yourself questions and like figuring out the answers along the way, compared to like a certificate where it's like yeah, this is like sort of web hacking where it's like this, you know, 2011 PHP 5 box with like LFI via, you know, file equals where it's like this, you know, you're never going to, you're never really going to see that maybe once or twice, but, but it's definitely not like a requirement. No. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, again, going back to like a certain thing, they do teach you a lot of the basics, but nothing's going to, um, nothing's going to beat the, all, you know, the hands-on experience that you're going to get on your own. Uh, yeah. It's hard to find bugs if you don't know what you're doing. But if you're trying stuff like, uh, you know, Hacker 101, Damn Vulnerable Web App, uh, Pentester Lab, and you learn the basics there, those skills are transferable to bug bounties. You just got to find the right place. Maybe don't go and look on like a Yahoo program when it's been around for six years, but go after, you know, DOD, GM, or whatever else. What programs do you tell people to hack on if they're new? What would you recommend to someone? There's a few... Uh... I would probably recommend DOD is awesome. I love the DOD so much because like there's just so much to look for. There's so many bugs and it's so interesting. Like you have a chance to hack on like the United States, like Department of Defense and they have right. like all these crazy assets. It's like, I don't know. It, it's the most like, that's probably the most like exciting, fun program. That's like easy to easy for beginners. Uh, yeah. But I think for like actual bounty stuff, uh, I really still do enjoy Verizon Media, but it's sort of kind of getting like really locked down uh, in the sense of like, there's a lot of hosts are taking offline. There's like a lot of, it's, it is a lot more difficult. It's been out for six years. Uh, so I think like switching, I would definitely suggest, I've seen a lot of success actually with people getting into bug bounty and spending more time on like, uh, you know, these private programs that are like maybe smaller companies and uh, are doing like invitations every, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Uh, I, I see a lot of success there where like, you know, for instance, like if you're getting into bug bounty uh, and your protocol bugs on DOD, you get your first private invitation, just spend time on that private program. You know, it may not be super successful, but I think there's like a lot of opportunity there. Um, are you just hacking on a single program yourself or are you hacking on multiple programs? How does that work? Uh, right now I'm like hacking on multiple programs. Uh, with the live hacking events, it's honestly been like kind of segmented where it's like live hacking event, you know, rest for like a bit mm -hmm. and then like hop on like a private program or like uh, spend time on like Yahoo. A lot of times like, uh, or Verizon Media, my, my, <laughs> they right. change the name so often. Both Yahoo, Verizon Media, same thing. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times like there'll be people, uh, I think back to collaboration, I guess, like there'll be people who are like, spending a lot of time researching something particular or like a particular program. And I think oftentimes it's like really fun to like work with them and uh, like spending a lot of time, like doing this project together. Uh, but I think I find myself more uh, doing what feels interesting to me. Uh, so for instance, like there'll be months where I just feel like I'm really, really interested in like client side bugs. And uh, for instance, on Verizon media, there's like the Chrome, which is the C surf token and like, leaking that crumb is like super, super vital for Yahoo. Uh, and it has like a lot of functionality. So I'd spend like a month just trying to like do that, like leak the crumb value. How do you, well, how do you pick your targets? Like what makes a program something you want to hack on? I think just like, uh, there's kind of the, the, the time response is really, really important. And then time about bounty also is really important. Uh, typically like, I'll pick programs that are like either interesting to me or they have like kind of not too many hackers and it's the bounties are decent and then the time the bounty is decent. Uh, I kind of think the feedback cycle of like submitting a bug and getting paid like relatively quickly is like really important, like maintaining that like motivation to hack. Uh, I tried programs which have like higher bounties, but like lower time to bounty and right. like you're like wow you know and it's just kind of demotivating uh 
at least for me. But you, you could bring it up motivation. Um, yeah. What motivates you to hack? I think just honestly, like, uh, I really don't think I'm that motivated by bounties. I think, I think bounties are fantastic. And like the actual process of getting paid is like absolutely fundamental and fantastic. But like, I, I feel more motivated to like exploring these interesting functionalities and kind of feeling like you've won uh, against like the application. It, it sounds kind of strange, but more in the sense of like, uh, you know, like you, your goal is you have a goal, you're goal oriented to find bugs. And then uh, you can kind of invent these like specific, you know, things to mess with. For instance, uh, at some of the life hacking events, they'll have like a challenge, right? And the challenge is like, if you find arbitrary account takeover, you know, we'll give you this bonus. And then okay. it's like, okay, this is my goal now. And then you go out and you do that goal. And then you've, you kind of feel like you've completed something. And the whole process along the way is like super entertaining and fun. So I think that's kind of more how it, how to stay motivated and like how to set out goals for that. So the the money and the bounties are just a uh, addition to. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like they're they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, like if you find a good bug and you get get paid for it, it's a great feeling. But I don't find that it's like necessary or necessarily like uh, the sole reason like why I go out and hunt bugs. I know you know some people uh, may be more interested in the bounties themselves than the actual process of hacking. And I think that's fine. But for me, it's very, uh, I enjoy the process a lot lot more than the actual bounties. I mean, that's fair enough. It is, you know, money isn't the only thing in the world, I think. It depends on yeah. your own, what you want to get out of it. Um, I enjoy the extra cash, but I also yeah. enjoy, you know, hacking on something I've never done. And there's a challenge of, you know, what you said, like you versus the application and you being able to beat it. It's a great feeling of accomplishment when you hack into a company or you find a vulnerability in their sites. Yeah, 100%. I think um, like the... Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say like a lot of a lot of security research is like super fascinating with just like uh, getting to like work on these applications that affect like billions of people. It just, it's a really strange, like exciting feeling. But, yeah. Tell me about the Tesla story. I know you wrote a blog on Tesla about the blind XSS, but I want to hear it from you. How did that work? How did it happen? Tell me. Talk, talk to me about yes. it. Yes. So I think like a, a year ago, I was like, uh, I'd, I'd been looking into buying or like buying a Tesla for like a really, really long time. And I finally like jumped on it and I did. And then when I got the car, uh, the first thing I did was just mess around with like the interface, or whatever. And I, I named my car like a blind XSS payload for fun. Uh, I didn't, at the time, I didn't really think it was anything that could actually like talk to Tesla. I just thought it'd be like client side on the car and be kind of fun. And then like uh, after driving the car a couple of weeks, I see like on my phone, like through the app, like there's the name of the car. So I'm like, oh, that's that's actually really interesting. The car, you know, is connected to Tesla.com, which connects to my phone. Like maybe I'll keep the name that. Cause you know, I was thinking about like, well, I'll just change it back. It's kind of getting a new sense, like, pulling out my phone and seeing this like blind XSS payload all the time. Like, but I was like, all right, I'll, I'll just keep it. And then, you know, a couple months pass. And like, after like, I was obsessively check my XSS hunter uh, every couple of days or whatever, just to see if there's anything going on and nothing, nothing really going on. And uh, I think a couple months later, I was like, it was the middle of summer and I was really wanted to do like a road trip because I'd never seen like uh, the West side of the United States. So I want to just drive down there. So I took this, I, me and a buddy uh, took this like really long road trip and we went from like middle of the United States to California and then back to uh, the middle of the United States again. And along the way, like I think like halfway through this huge rock uh, like cracks my windshield and it's like, all right, whatever. Uh, I'm, I didn't mind too much. I mean, it's just like a crack windshield or whatever, but we go to the Airbnb and uh, I, you know, I pull up the app and I file like a support request and I'm like, Hey, here's what happened. Uh, here's a photo of the crack. And could I schedule like a service appointment? And then like I get a message back. I'm like, hey, we looked into it. We'll set you up a service appointment. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And the next day, uh, when we finally got to like the place we were staying, I pulled my laptop and just hacking. And I checked my success hunter. And uh, I see like a notification of like, you know, some internal Tesla domain. I'm like, oh my God. And on the page, there's like all these statistics about the car. Uh, it was obviously like a support agent who viewed it. And like, I see like, you know, miles per hour I was driving uh, and like all this, all this information about my car and something, uh, some, 
I, I'd immediately filed the report and like submitted all this stuff. Uh, but something really interesting that I kind of realized after this is that uh, that page actually disclosed the keys to the vehicle, uh, which essentially means that like someone could remote into the car essentially. So if you're able to, you could essentially enumerate uh, that response and pull any vehicle via just like an incremental numeric ID. Yikes. And essentially, yeah. So the impact of that was actually really, really significant. Uh, but at first I thought it was kind of just like, you know, you can view statistics about vehicles. Uh, yeah, afterwards it was just kind of crazy. So in the DOM, it had your key pretty much, and you could just pull yeah. it. Wow, that's yeah. insane. Yeah, the, the, the actual, I can't, I, I can't talk about anything too specific with it, but it was, you know, it, imagine you're a car company and you want full service, you know, you're a level four tech support guy right. uh, who can go in and mess with a car. Like, that's the level of, you know, if you wanted to change a file, right, you could change a file on the car. The whole, the whole Tesla system is like this Linux system. So, I mean, it's just really crazy level access. Let's talk about a few more of your bugs. You have one about uh, reading ASP secrets. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did that happen? Um, walk me through it again. If anyone hasn't seen it, it's on the screen right now. Go on his website if you want to read the whole thing. Uh, yes. Tell me, how does this how does this happen? So there was a, it was actually like a live hacking event, and that was the target for the live hacking event. And there was like this, uh, after logging into the website, there's like this parameter to view files. And initially, like I saw it, and it was uh, like an encrypted string for the, you know, file parameter. Uh, so it's like something like slash download that ASPX question mark file equals whatever. Uh, and it's like this encrypted like AES something, uh, you know, uh, ciphertext. And I was like, okay, uh, maybe there's something we could do with the ciphertext. Uh, I wasn't super interested initially, but then like going back to it, uh, I started to play around with it. And one of the things I supplied to it was just the name of the file itself. Uh, and the reason I did that was because like a good portion of the time there's like some sort of local file disclosure, local file inclusion vulnerability. The directory that it's working out is the same one that it's in. Uh, so I think it's really been just an easy thing to check for is just passing the file name itself. And when I did that, the error return was like different than any error I'd seen. And uh, I was thinking about it and I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Maybe like, uh, it's definitely able to see that like download ASPX is like a real thing. Uh, but this error is kind of bland. It didn't really give me anything. But then I passed in uh, .aspx.cs, which is like the ASP.NET like source file. And uh, it returned like the contents of the page. And I was like, okay, this is super interesting because now I can read the actual source of this page. But the next thing I tried was just uh, traversing one directory down, uh, giving the name of the folder that I was currently in, and then also the name of the file. And when it did that, it gave like a security error. So uh, it was checking for like, dot dot you know had some sort of blacklist for determining whether or not you're traversing a directory right. and i spent a lot of time like trying to figure out i was thinking like you know is there any way uh to defeat like you know a check for two dots put together so i went through like the standard checklist of like encoding and trying to figure out if there's some sort of thing to do and eventually i kind of was like okay one thing i could check for is uh if there's any character which is being removed because if you have like the two dots uh and then like whatever characters in between, if this character gets removed, you know, they get slammed together and then you get dot dot slash or whatever to like right. first back out. So I just sent it to intruder uh, and kind of like manually test it for a little bit. And eventually I got a response of like 200, which gave me that same initial uh, source code. Okay. And so I was, I was able to traverse out of it. And then from there, I just went about exploring the file system and pulling eventually web.config. And then uh, once I had that, I worked with another researcher, uh, Shubs, and we put together like a script to test the keys that were leaked uh, in the web.config file. And then we were able to score a pretty nice bounty with that. Very cool. That was a $17,000 bounty. Yeah. So, so you, write a, you write a lot of blog posts. Um, why is it important to share, dude? Why, do you, so, why are you so in for writing or sharing your knowledge and writing articles like that? I think it's it's really important for uh, when I think of like bug hunting and when I think of like web application security stuff and when I think of all this stuff, I think of really like a community to be honest. Uh, and I think like 
you know, just being an active person in the community uh, and being able to like share what you've been working on is just like a, is such a great way to like uh, kind of connect with other people. And uh, you know, there are a lot of people who like find it educational or interesting. And I think that's like awesome. So if, if someone ends up on my blog to like find out how I did something or uses it like to further uh, their research, then I think that's awesome. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier like about motivation and I think like playing a role in like a community is like such a good way to like actually uh, be a really active participant in something and like stay motivated for a longer period of time and just kind of stay enthusiastic about something. Uh, so I think for me, like it, it's great to share stuff as like it just helps, but at the same time, like I think it's great for everybody else uh, to be able to see that and like to be able to interact with that. And I really enjoy the process. Um, so one of the things I always ask all my guests towards the end is, what are three things you you wish you knew before you, uh, when you first started bug bounty hunting? Three things that you have learned in the past three four years, and you know you wish you would have known these early on. I got you. Uh, the first thing is just the whole like dropping ego or dropping like expectations for yourself as someone who's like competing uh, is just such a great way to like move forward. I think when a lot of people start in security or start in bug bounty, it's so much comparison and it's like so much uh, stress based on this idea that like you're nobody and you've got to eventually like become somebody or like f like learn this stuff. But like when you drop ego and like drop these expectations for yourself, it makes it so much easier to like move forward. Uh, I think secondly, like uh, just not worrying about your process of learning as long as I think as long as you're enthusiastic or as long as you sort of enjoy the process of like learning or figuring something out, uh, you may not enjoy the whole thing. For instance, like uh, maybe you're trying to find a bug and you feel like you're close, you're enjoying it, but then you have to write a script for it. Yeah, maybe that's okay. Maybe like, you know, so you have to write a script and it's stressful. You spend an hour doing it. And it's like, yeah, I hate this. But like, as long as you're like enthusiastic about it, I think it's like absolutely fantastic. And it's such a great way to like move forward. Uh, but then lastly, I'm trying to think. It's a, a hard question. <laughs> it definitely is. Yeah. Um, Anything about money management, anything about okay. learning? So I think, yeah, money management's a really, if you, once you actually start getting going or start like getting going and bug bounty, like money management is like super, super important. Um, um, you know, I've, I've seen, there's some people who have like started out in bug bounty and like gotten, maybe not lucky, but maybe they have a really successful month or two and, you know, they got and do something crazy. Uh, don't do that. Focus on like, one of the things I love about bug bounty is like, I feel very like comfortable. Like you'd talking, we'd spoken earlier about like uh, being comfortable, but like having the mindset of like, uh, you know, like being able to like really save up money while you can and then like prepaying stuff and being able to work like while you're in a comfortable environment is like super, super important. Uh, you know, for instance, like if for some reason you find like a couple bugs that are expensive, like you're not gonna, you may not make that all year, you know, maybe that month you're lucky and then 12 months down the line, you're like, oh, I didn't make as significantly as much as I thought I would. Uh, yeah, just, I, I would, I definitely suggest, there's a lot of talk about like, people say like, oh, you know, maybe bug bounty won't last and maybe it eventually dies or the payouts get lower. And I think that, you know, you kind of have to assume that's a possibility. Uh, maybe all the signs point toward it not being that, but having the mindset that this is like a short term thing that's like lasting for a shorter period of time and having to manage your finances like that is super important i think yeah i, I definitely agree with the the money aspect of it like you know you get that big payment you know especially if you're younger and you've never done that kind of a you never, never had that kind of a cash you're going to blow through it but it's always good to remember to like save up a little bit um you're not going to always have a good month or a big month yeah um, invest in something i don't know if it's a house or a car or stocks or someone's business whatever that is uh do something good with the money instead of you know buying toys and gadgets and skins for your weapons on the game <laughs> oh hey it's yeah, my absolutely. five month anniversary oh what's up it's, 
Sorry, there's a, there's a loud sound going on. Give it a second. <laughs> you good? There we go. <laughs> yeah, but there's definitely uh, there's a few bug bounty hunters who are like really really big into uh, Ryanator, Justin Gardner. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ever have an opportunity to you know like tweet him or send a message about investing in bug bounty, he'll have a he'll give you a full lesson on buying properties and all that stuff. But I yeah, gotta get, I gotta get Justin in here. I just took a note of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Tell me, how has, uh, I want to ask you two more questions before we get into the fun part of the interview, but gotcha. how has Bug Bounties uh, changed your life? Uh, completely. I think just absolutely completely. Uh, at the end of high school, like, I really didn't have, like, too much of a direction. Uh, just felt like kind of, like, more, you know, like, oh, maybe I'll go to university and maybe mm -hmm. I'll do something. But uh it's it kind of seemed to be like almost too good to be true because like as like i mentioned earlier like even before i found bug bounty i was like sort of doing stuff similar to it and being able to like have that like it's like finding your dream job essentially and from that like uh i like when i was younger uh like growing up we we really weren't like super we were really like poor uh and then, like, being able to, like, find, like, something that's, like, very, like, lucrative uh, and just being able to, like, have fun doing it and, like, help out and all this stuff has just been really, really awesome. Uh, I think, like, uh, you know, some of my family members didn't have, like, a good, you know, like, springboard to be able to, like, uh, find jobs or anything like that. So being able to kind of support, you know, my family and their, like, process of, uh, you know, like, finding jobs and stuff like that has been, like, super, super nice. And it's just been great. Yeah, it completely changed my life. Yeah, um, it's cool to hear people's reaction to it. There's some things that I, I, I've asked you that I think you know I know the answer to. Uh, but I also want people to understand, like, everyone comes from a different background. Everyone's done this differently. But at the end of the day, if you've invested time in yourself with bug bounties, it's changed something in your life. Whether if it's monetary, whether if it's making friends, whether if it's getting a dream job paying for you know getting yourself out of debt whatever that is buying a house buying a car whatever that is and you have one of those unique um stories you know you've i've i've had the pleasure to work with you at some uh point uh, i've gone to hang out with you you have some really cool stories you know going to school and not wanting to do you were in high school i think when we met um yeah. you were just finishing high school and you know you're still at a young age and doing all these different things and you know hacking tests is a big deal you're spending a lot of time is what i'm trying to get to and you did some cool stuff. But it's also got to be a little bit hard to do all these things. You know, when you're uh, 19, 20, doing hacking, spending it full time, there's got to be some sort of a burnout. Um, do you, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not assuming that you deal with burnout, but I think burnouts are very natural for everybody. Do you deal with it at all? Do you have times when you're completely super burnt out on hacking? And if, if so, how do you deal with it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the last like couple months actually from from November to December like I have terrible like every winter here it's just like I just feel like terribly depressed uh so like when it came to like hacking stuff like it was just very it's super hard to like find the motivation to like do it and yeah. I think like one of the really hard things for bug bounty especially if you're doing it full-time is like at first it's like this idea of like you know you do it anytime you want you love doing it but eventually it becomes like a just a habit and a process and then like one day you wake up and you're like I've done the exact same thing the last month and I don't want to do this anymore. That creative part of my brain is not working. Uh, you know, it's like writer's block essentially. Uh, but I don't know. One of the things I found is just like, uh, you see it like recommended all the time, but like taking the first step to actually do it, like physical activity, like going to the gym or whatever, like, uh, taking a step back is like super, super important. Uh, yeah, every every like probably like six months or so, I'll face like a really bad burnout. Uh, but just you know, taking a step back, going to the gym, uh, working with friends, uh, and just doing something I really enjoy, like video games or whatever, it helps a lot. So yeah, I mean, it's it's got to be hard with uh, with burnouts. Like, I mean, if you're doing it full time, dude, it's got to be a time where you're not finding anything, and <laughs> it becomes a little mental. I feel like, and you just need to distract yourself. Mine is. I completely disappear. I'm going to be disappearing in March for two weeks. And I've been saying it. I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I don't want any electronics. Um, I just want to completely forget about everything that I've done. 
And I think it's a I really, it, it helps to come back with that fresh perspective of like anything, even if it's attacking, whatever it is, it helps to just completely forget about it, detach yourself, remove yourself entirely, and then come back to it. Yeah. And then the one That's... last, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, you're fine. I was going to say, the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about is um, imposter syndrome. Uh, I want to hear from someone who's still in their early stages of doing bug bounties and security, but also at the same time putting out content and putting out blog posts. Do you deal with imposter syndrome? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's really it's really difficult to uh, to be good at to be good at like one thing, right? I, I see web application security as like this one field in security with all these different things going on. Mm -hmm. And when you're involved in security, you're working with a lot of people who are really good at like one thing. For instance, uh, you know, like Smeagles and Shubs and all these guys are like incredibly good at DNS and like uh, recon and all this crazy stuff. And when I have a conversation with these guys, it's like, wow, I know absolutely nothing about this. You know, I feel kind of down. Uh, and really often I'll be in conversations where it's like, I kind of have to like manually stop myself from like, hey, like these people invest a lot of time into this. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I definitely deal with imposter syndrome like a lot. Uh, yeah. Do you, um, does that bother you in any way? Does that stop you from doing what you do? How do you cope with it when you, when you think you have imposter syndrome, but how do you deal with that? I think like uh, being able to, being able to like, work alongside people over time and just uh honestly like every once in a while like i'll kind of message somebody like hey like uh i don't know like kind of be open with people about like how i'm feeling about it and then i don't know most like just it's having having that conversation with someone else a lot of times like helps uh i think taking a step back and like seeing how far you've, you've come over time yeah. uh one of the things i really like to do is like work with I'll work with other people a lot of times, like younger, like people who are in high school or like uh, people who are like getting started in security and, you know, they'll, they'll shoot me a question or whatever and I'll spend a lot of time working with them. And it really helps like kind of uh, be a, bit, a little bit more confident because you realize a lot of just like these little things you wouldn't, you don't feel like you've come to know or like come to understand, but you realize like there's all the stuff that you've like slowly accumulated over time. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. There's, it doesn't really feel like there's a surefire like solution to defeating imposter syndrome. But it just, I think it's kind of like taking a step back a lot of time. I like what you said uh, about taking a step back and recognizing how far you have come. That's a big deal. Like if you if you recognize that and you you realize that you know three years ago you were doing something completely different than bug bounty hunting, and you have made a living out of it. You've you know you've accomplished some stuff. You have. You have hacked on big companies like Tesla, Yahoo, for your case at least. You've bought a car out of this. You have, you know, you have helped other people learn from your blog post by putting them out, and recognizing that is a really good way of dealing with imposter syndrome. I don't think imposter syndrome is going to ever go away, but having a way to remind yourself, like I've done these things with my own life, like I'm proud of doing these things, and not being so, like you know, you're not going too down in the rabbit hole of, well, I don't know these things that other people know. And I think Stoke is, that's a good way of saying it. It's imposter syndrome happens when you compare yourself to other people. So if you don't yeah. compare yourself, you don't have to deal with it. And I know it's it's easier said than done, um, but it's a part of it. And you have to recognize how much work you have uh, accomplished in a short amount of time. Uh, yes, so really. one last question. I want to hear your 140 to 180 characters advice for new hackers. Make it short and sweet. What do you have, Sam? <laughs> let's see oh my gosh these questions are so uh hard to think about um there aren't too many there aren't almost any prerequisites to getting started in hacking just try it i or i guess more uh there's this really there's this this is not even 140 characters anymore but uh I'm trying to remember. Don't worry about the limitation of the character. I, just want to <laughs> give, I want you to give them like a short, um, yeah. you know, short advice on how to get started. People that are new are doing and grinding and trying to learn, but you know, it's not easy. It's harder. But what do you have to like? What advice do you have to give them? This is definitely like age old, but uh, hack to learn, don't learn to hack. I think it's definitely like my all time favorite quote for security stuff. Uh, I think it's definitely like just something to su subscribe to, and then like it introduces just like a you know, everything, the methodology and all that stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good advice hack to learn. I mean, you you're doing something to learn. Everything else that comes with it. It's a you know, it's a supplement or an addition to it, right? Yeah. Um, I agree. It, it's it's hard. I, I I know I'm putting you on the spot with these advices and stuff like that. But it's also because people that watch these, most of the newer folks that watch, is they they want to know how to get started. Um, they want to uh, hear you know what advice you have to give them. Um, let's move to the second part of the interview. The second part of the interview, I ask you. Some easy questions, but I ask you also um, some, I give you a word, and when I give you this word, the first thing that comes into your mind, you just react to it. It's just for fun. It's nothing serious. I'm Um, good. But let's start with the first part of it. Um, I've changed the wording on this question, but gun to your head, you have to hack on one bug bounty program for the rest of your life. What program is it? I was gonna say a private program, but can't say that. Uh, Verizon Media, one hundred percent. Yeah, why is that? Yeah, I just I don't know. They're constantly changing. Uh, they're not in a mean way, but their patches are a bit of hacky a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So it it feels like a CTF sort of a little bit, and I just enjoy it. Uh, I love their team. Uh, I love the bugs that are on their program, and I love their whole infrastructure. Uh, what was your first bug bounty program you ever hacked on? Verizon Media, or actually, I think it was this program called Skyline, which was a really, really long time ago. Oh. Uh, it was a tiny program. I think they're away now. So, how much was your first bounty? Five hundred bucks. How long did it take you to get that first bounty? I think a little bit over a month, uh, but I think I've I had a probably honestly like. In the long course of things, probably like uh, being involved in the community for like four or five years, uh, being interested in it for a long time and like spending a lot of time like passively learning, you know, so one month from start to finish, like on Hacker One, but a long time for being invested in the community. Do you remember what your first purchase was with your first bounty? <laughs> it's probably it's probably like a soda from a gas station, to be honest. Uh like a soda. Did snack. you have any? Did you have any big purchases that you've done with your first bounties? Yeah, I'd, uh, when I when I was like really into hacking, I bought my mom a car. Uh, oh. I was like, I'm 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 I feel like honestly like the whole like I'm really I feel like I'm really bad at spending money. Like I'm terrible at uh, like for small purchases, it's like very like I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. But like the big purchases, like I feel like that it's more comfortable with. Well, let's talk about this one. What is your most meaningful purchase or thing I've done with your bounty money? Um, I think the initial, uh, I think the most like personally like meaningful was just like buying, I was able to purchase like a plane ticket to Las Vegas for the first H1702 that I attended. And I think for me that, that shaped everything else. Uh, I was introduced to like this, like incredible community, made a bunch of friends, uh, and just like kind of started this whole chain of events that just super, super important. Just attending DEF CON, attending H1702, getting to meet and work with these people. Did you have any big purchases that was personal to you? Something that you wanted to do that bug bounties allowed you to do it? Uh, yeah, I think, I think buying like, uh, we, I, I, I think maybe like a couple of years in the bug bounty, we, me, my mom, and my girlfriend went on like a trip together, and it was just really nice. Uh, being able to spend like uh, being able to spend time, like, time with your family. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's cool. That's fair enough. I mean, you, buying a car for your mom—that's such a big one. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, that's a really big thing to do. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. And also taking your girlfriend and your mom on a vacation—that's also awesome. Yeah. I want to kind of show the things that could happen with uh, bug bounties if you're investing the time. What are some things you can do? And I think doing something for your parents definitely wants to. Okay. Um, what was your first bug type that you reported? I think it was uh, broken access control, actually. There was a uh, basic off prompt on that Skyline program. And if you hit cancel, it would just let you access the page. So for some reason, they're displaying it but not enforcing it. So... Okay. Broken access control. What is your uh, favorite bug type? Uh, Server-side request forgery, just because it 
most of the time I find that it's on Verizon Media, and it's just like always a really, really fun chain of events, like to actually exploit it and prove the impact. Uh, yeah, I really like server side request forgery. Um, what are some hackers you collaborated with that you enjoyed working with? Uh, Doggy G, Jack Cable, uh, Jazzy, uh, Pedro. Uh, yeah, there's a there's there's a ton, but uh, just just Ziat. Uh, there's just a bunch of people. I can't really think. I feel bad if I left left some people out, but in the moment, there's just a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. What are some uh, who are some hackers that you wish you could hang you you wish you could uh, collaborate with or you want to collaborate with? Franz and Matthias. I think I not like I don't I don't know either of them super well, but I always hear like crazy stories about them finding bugs, and I really like to see their process and work with them. Okay, fair enough. Um, what's your favorite tool? Burp Suite. <laughs> not really the most general answer. Give me one of your favorite hobbies that's not on a computer. It doesn't include video games. That can't be it. Outside of tech, not on a computer. I got you. Um, I really like uh, longboarding and skateboarding. I have like three or four skateboards and like a electronic skateboard. But when it gets nice, nice here, I love going out. Very cool. Let's jump into the second part. It's going to be short. I'll give you a word. You just tell me what the first thing that pops into your mind. Sentence or a word. All right. Um, SSRF. Uh, bounty, but I mean, that's, yeah. Bounty was the first thing that popped my head. XSS. Browser. Uh, bug bounties. Fun. <laughs> Hacker one. I was going to say fun, but I just said that before. Uh, I think I have black. I have, with the whole like hack ones marketing black. Um, Rise in media. I think of a bat squirrel is the name of a triager who I used to work like really really closely with. That's the first that you always remember. Yeah, I will. She had this photo of, like a squirrel, and yeah. So I mean, when you said that, first thing uh, in my head. Tesla. XSS. Life hacking events. Collaboration. And the last one, I want you to tell me a story about this one after you tell me your reaction. Steam phishing campaign. Oh, yeah, that one was super, super interesting. Uh, my reaction is like the first thing that pops in my head reaction. Yeah. Uh, very investigative. I felt like a, that, that felt very interesting. Do you want to talk about what it was? Can you talk about it? Yeah, I think, you, yeah. You wrote a blog post about it, right? Yeah, yeah. They let me. They didn't give any Let's reason not to. That. Let's make that our last thing before we open up the questions. Um, <laughs> what was that steam fishing thing that happened? Yeah, so like I'm, I'm really big into video games. I love video games a lot, and uh, I play like a bunch of CS:GO. And like, I kept getting friend requests from just random people, and so I started accepting them. And they're all saying the same thing, which is like, "Hey, you know, like I want to trade you my knife. Click this link, and then you click it, and it's like." Uh, you know, this obviously like a fake Steam login. And for fun, like I sent like, I just started sending like blind XSS payloads to all these things. Uh, same, like same thing as the Tesla thing, but eventually like one of them fired on this like administrative panel on the thing and I, I click it and it's like this one page and it has like this information. And from there you can tell that there's like a huge number of domains and the, the phishing, the phishing administrative panel had just like a live feed of just credentials and credentials of credentials of people, you know, like trying to authenticate, trying to transfer inventory. And uh, I was like, what's going on? So like, I kind of took a step back and went to investigate it. And uh, I, I found like there was just like dozens and dozens and dozens of domains and like thousands and thousands of credentials. So I, th I think eventually like w what I ended up doing is just sending the Steam program or Valve program just like a huge report with just everything that was going on, uh, the sites that were affected, the users that were affected, and then they paid out like a bounty for it. But crazy stuff. <laughs> I just yeah. linked to the, I just found the blog post and linked to it. <laughs> what was really cool about it was how you enumerated it. You you yeah. found this header that was like powered by something. And then you were just on showdown, just looking at every single instance. And I remember you just going through every single one and just giving it <laughs> an access payload. 
Uh, I forgot about that until uh, we started talking about stuff, and it was cool to uh, see your, you know, curiosity and you getting annoyed with all these trade <laughs> messages. And it was a very uh, that portal was very very well done. Like if you think about it, it has some really yeah. magic, crazy stuff happening in the back. To Absolutely. The, to the point of like they figure out how to even go about to a phase and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so if you're watching this, uh, I linked it in the chat. Just go on Sam's blog and um, check it out. Let's do. It's eleven. Four, it's one fourteen. If you guys have any questions, let's do five minutes of questions. I try to say ahead of the questions. If you guys have anything that I didn't answer, this is your chance to ask Sam whatever you want. Okay, someone's linking to it. Are there any? Um, do you, do you how do you think this industry is going to pan out in the next three to five years? What do you think book buyers are headed to? I think honestly, we're at a point right now where I feel like it's going to kind of be stable. More companies are going to be getting involved, but the bounty you know bounty tables are going to be similar, uh, and like the kind of whole process is going to be very similar. But the number of companies is going to get drastically like higher. Uh, I think standards are going to be set for programs to follow, uh, not necessarily enforced by the platforms, but just like general standards for how bug money, money operates. Uh, I think the platforms are probably going to, there's a lot of room that needs to be filled for like, uh, you know, companies that want pen tests and sub bug bounty programs. And I think like platforms are probably going to like step into that space a little bit. Uh, compliance stuff, maybe. Uh, I see like a lot of interesting stuff with like platforms providing compliance testing. Uh, but honestly, it feels, it really does feel like it's going to kind of, Stay about this, you know, same level of intensity where bounty payouts. Uh, hopefully, some more live hacking events. That'd be really cool. I agree. Like live hacking events <laughs> definitely something big. Yeah. Um, have you gotten any job offers through doing bug bounties? Yeah, I actually got. Uh, when I, after working like a couple of years in bug bounty, uh, I gave a talk at like. A, it was sort of through bug bounty, but I gave a talk at like a local security conference about like my work in bug bounty, and someone reached out and said, "Hey, you know." we'd like to interview you for something. And I ended up working like uh, about like six months, I think, uh, just at this like security con consultancy. And I left because uh, I enjoyed bug bounty a lot more, but there have been a lot of uh, people like reaching out for pen tests and things like that. And I've done like actually a couple of pen tests uh, through bug bounty. That's cool. Um, how do you choose who you collaborate with? Uh, I think it's just more like uh, I, there are a lot of people with very particular skill sets. Uh, for instance, uh, Jazzy, uh, he's like absolutely fantastic at like low level stuff and uh, you know binary stuff. Like for instance, if I like didn't didn't know something about an application, I was like, hey, you know, if you want to work with us, just spending time like working with someone. Not necessarily like that sounds a bit exploitive, but more in the terms of like everybody has their own skill set. And like right. if I find something that they'd like to enjoy like working with, then sending it to them and then spending time working with them on it. I don't think it's uh, exploitive. You you pretty much are selecting people that can bring a value to what you do. You don't you don't need to collaborate with someone who does the same exact thing as you do because that's kind of pointless. Yeah. You need to you need to have someone you can learn from and then they can learn from you for these things that they don't know how to do. Yeah, exactly. Um what is the next one? How do you map out the functionality of a core app of any target like Yahoo or AOL? I think it's more just uh to be honest, it kind of like sort of reveals itself to you. Uh from for instance, mapping out core functionality, uh, I don't really take like too extensive notes of what's going on, but mm -hmm. uh, one of, uh, there's a lot of stuff like I'll keep tabs on, like subdomains and like uh, certain interesting things, but like just exploring the app, like for instance, uh, there's like login registration for Yahoo. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, I'll throw it into Burp Suite. Uh, and then like just following the whole process of like get, you know, slash login all the way down to like, you know, where you're actually logged in the dub, dub, dub. Uh, and just like kind of messing with that whole process and just trying to figure out interesting behaviors within that. Uh, for instance, like uh, something like the dot done parameter, which is the URL that you get redirected to, uh, spending time like trying to identify how that behaves. You know, for instance, uh, does yahoo.net work for the dot done parameter? If so, then maybe I could use that in the future for something. Uh, and just kind of that process. Uh, but for actual like, just like core functionalities, uh, just in terms of like how the actual business or like website works, uh, for instance, you have something like Yahoo News where like people can post comments. Uh, just understanding like it's, 
the, the comment modules like role within like the actual application. Like for instance, uh, users can share links, right? right? And if a user can share a link, they can you know potentially XSS the page. And if they have XSS there, it's like really important as it's like .yahoo.com. Therefore, you know, it's important to like, it'd be a good bug if you could find XSS there. Do you have any automation at all? I have a little bit. I've worked, I've been working a lot more with like building turbo intruder scripts for certain things. Uh, I'll automate, I'll automate certain things about Yahoo, but it's kind of more uh, certain bug classes that kind of pop up over time with Yahoo every once in a while. Uh, just identifying like things to like work with that specifically. I think the most like, I don't really have any long-term autom automation stuff, but for like short terms when like opportunities pop up, I'll build something for it. Okay. Do you focus, do you think for new hackers it should focus on one bug class or do you think it should spread it across all bug types? I, I agree with Yobert. Uh, Yobert had mentioned this before actually and where he's saying like uh, one, focusing on one bug class. Mm -hmm. And I agree with, I agree with that entirely. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily a requirement like you have to do one bug class or like two bug classes or something like that, but more in terms of uh, spend time, like pick something you, you enjoy, right? Like if right. you don't enjoy the process of hacking, you're kind of done for. Uh, like maybe you have the, you know, best will in the world and you can like sit down and hack for 40 hours a week and you hate it, but that just sounds terrible. So like if you enjoy XSS, why not spend time doing XSS? What is the first bug type you think people should... Uh learn uh probably <laughs> xss <laughs> yeah yeah why oh well, i think it, it introduces you to this idea of like uh it's a client-side vulnerability and it introduces you to the idea of your input on your like hp requests or you know uh, let's avoid dom xss for now but like your your request uh essentially creates like a response and you have certain parameters that you can like interact with so for instance, if I have like this parameter and uh, I can observe the response here, therefore I can mess with the parameter and identify different responses. So I think like one, it introduces you to this whole idea of like the relationships between yourself and the server. And then like secondarily, like just how the server like defends or like- uh, Reacts to it. You know, yeah, exactly. Do you have a checklist or a methodology you follow or you just built your own by getting used to your own workflow? Yeah, just getting used to my own workflow. I don't really have a method, like a set methodology or like set checklist, but more over time, I've kind of noticed uh, just the idea of exploring the app, finding things that are interesting, and then uh, spending more time on those and other things. And one last question, and I think that's something that I should have covered earlier. Do you play any CTFs or do you um, play any hack the box or anything like that? Yeah, uh, I, I don't really play too often. Uh, situationally, yeah, every once in a while. Like, uh, my university has, like, a hacking club, and we'll do CTFs every once in a while. And then also, like, uh, teaching, I'll, I'll introduce other people to, like, Hack the Box and spend time working with them, but not really, not too much. Cool. Well, everyone's saying that this was a lot of good information. I appreciate you joining me today, dude. This was very cool, and uh, as always, I love catching up with you. It's been a while since you and I have talked, and at the live hacking events, you guys all look like you're, you know, busy going, <laughs> running around all crazy trying to figure things out. Yeah. So I don't want to bother you guys, but uh, this was really fun. Um, thanks so much for joining, and thank you for uh, sharing all your knowledge with us, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And thanks for you guys, on. make sure you follow Sam on Twitter. Go to his blog. You guys, some of the best blog was I've ever seen. Check him out. Um, Security B is going to drop the link here in a sec. But thanks again, dude, and uh, I'll see you next week. Yeah, of course. See you, Ben. See you, dude. Thanks. All right. That was very awesome. Uh, I'm glad that Sam was uh, able to make it and share some stuff with us. But as promised, I want to go through some of these. Um, 